and its youngest victims. Is Russia going to return Ukrainian children? The due date for all the Ukrainians. When do we have to expect for a long-awaited spring counteroffensive? And the Kremlin Studios presents new blockbusters made by the Russian propaganda are on all the screens. You're watching Spotlight Ukraine, trans world politics, and deep analytics made by the Ukrainian journalists to the whole globe. My name is Volodymyr Slavchuk. More details right now. And the first thing I said when I saw the Ukrainian flag, glory to Ukraine. Did you adopt a child from Mariupol yourself? Yes, thanks to you. Now I know what it's like to be a mother of a child from Donbass. Is everything okay? I'm fine. Everything is fine. No, all I want is to live. More than 19,000 Ukrainian children were illegally deported from the occupied territories by the terrorist country. And these are only those whose names are known. Entire orphanages and boarding schools were taken away, almost 4,400 orphans. According to human rights activists, they will be the most difficult to return because children are immediately given up for adoption and re-educated in the spirit of Russian propaganda. And even those who are sought by their parents change their citizenship and are placed in families. They are also mocked for the slightest mention of Ukraine. Hello. <laughs> Hugs with the closest ones after months of separation, fear and moral pressure. These children have different stories, but share the same tragedy of being abducted by Russia. Honestly, I didn't believe it, but I dreamed about it. And the first thing I said when I saw the Ukrainian flag, glory to Ukraine. Kirillo and his grandmother had to flee Russia. The 12-year-old from Nikopol ended up there with his mother, who suddenly died. For several months, his grandmother begged the Russian social services to return the child, but they were banned from traveling abroad. So they decided to flee through Belarus. They left me no other choice. They forced me to adopt my grandson. Then they told me to take over guardianship. And then, since I'm Ukrainian, not their citizen, I was not allowed to be given guardianship. I had only one option, to live with volunteers and my grandson, either to win or lose. But Ukrainians never lose. Currently, 19,500 minors are known to have been deported to Russia, said Daria Kerasimchuk, Ukrainian ombudsman for children's rights. There is a list of names compiled on the basis of statements from relatives, authorities or witnesses. The Kremlin claims that 744,000 Ukrainian children have been so-called evacuated, but this figure has not been confirmed, Kerasimchuk said. Moscow does not hide the fact that they are not going to return the children, testifying themselves to their crimes. Our main result is the children of Donbass who have been hosted by our families. When the evacuation of children's institutions in different regions began, at a meeting with the president, I suggested hosting children who have citizenship by our families. And he said to me, why only those who have citizenship? We need all of them. According to the official, 380 Ukrainian children have already been adopted in Russia. At the same time, she openly lies that those who have parents are not given up for adoption. 12-year-old Matvi from Mariupol and his two sisters almost ended up in a Russian family while their father was held in prison in Olenivka. Do you want to go to a foster family or into an orphanage? Well, until your dad takes you away chose, they insisted. I said I wouldn't give an answer until I contacted my dad. I called him and three days later he came to Moscow. 
Russian ombudsperson for children's rights adopted a teenager who was abducted from Mariupol, 16-year-old Filip Holovnya. The boy's aunt, who was his legal guardian, probably died in a Russian filtration camp, and Filip ended up in a sanatorium in a Moscow region. Did you adopt a child from Mariupol yes, yourself? Yes, thanks to you. A small one? No, 15 years old. Now I know what it's like to be a mother of a child from Donbass. The official also tells Putin how much she loves her adopted son, but for some reason she is mistaken about his age. There is a lot of interesting information about her in the Russian media. She has 17 children and people with disabilities under her care. She forced adults to take out loans and patronized two nursing homes for the disabled in the city of Pemza, where residents mysteriously died. We cannot verify this information, but the abduction of Ukrainian children is a proven fact. And it was the ombudsperson's conversation with the dictator that became the main evidence against them. On March 17th, the criminal court in Haag issued an international arrest warrant for Putin and Lvova Belova for the illegal deportation of Ukrainian children. It is forbidden by international law for occupied powers to transfer civilians from the territory they live in to other territories. Children enjoy special protection under the Geneva Convention. The deported children who were returned to Ukraine say that they were threatened with isolation, bored in schools, beaten with sticks and taken away in an unknown direction for shouting glory to Ukraine. They were told that their parents had abandoned them. Russia's abduction of Ukrainian children is a crime against our country. It will have a devastating impact on Ukraine for many years to come, according to the report released by the U.S. State Department. The report provides evidence of the Russian government's systematic efforts to severe communications between the taken children and their relatives at home in Ukraine, prevent the children's return to Ukraine and re-educate them to become pro-Russia. Mounting evidence of Russia's action lays bare the Kremlin's aims to deny and suppress Ukraine's identity, history and culture. The devastating impacts of Putin's war of Ukraine's children will be felt for generations. However, Russia itself does not recognize the illegal deportation of children or the decision of the Hague court. In response to the warrant, State Duma Speaker Vyacheslav Volodin proposed to introduce responsibility in the country for facilitating and supporting of the International Criminal Court. The terrorist country has not signed the Rome Statute and the ISIS's jurisdiction does not apply to it. However, 123 countries including Russia's allies, have ratified the statute and are obliged to immediately arrest Putin and Lvova Belova on their territories. And now it's time to discuss the very difficult issue with the stolen Ukrainian kids and deported to Russian Federation with my first guest tonight. This is Monsieur Gabriel Seba, who's lawyer at the Paris Bar. Monsieur Seba, hello and welcome. Hello, thank you for having me. Thank you for finding some time and discussing this very complex and but very vital and important issue for all the Ukrainians in Ukraine and all abroad. So my first question is, how will the International Criminal Court force Russia to return kidnapped children to Ukraine? I mean, is there any procedure, so step one, step two, step three, and can the International Criminal Court force Russia to do something? So, yeah, it's a very good question. The, the purpose of the International Criminal Court and the Bureau of the Prosecutor is not directly to, to force Russia to return the children. It's mainly to take uh, Vladimir Putin and Maria Lvova Belova uh, to court and to judge them for what they, are, they have done. Uh, so the purpose of the International Criminal Court is not directly to force Russia to return the children. But what we can expect and hope is that with the pressure of in the International Criminal Court and the arrest warrants, the, this pressure will, will lead the Russian Federation and Maya Lvova Belova and Vladimir Putin to 
um, return to children and perhaps stop the policy of deportation. But it's it's only a hope, and it is also why uh, the prosecutor made public this these arrest warrants because they are normally confidential. So this publicity is to put pressure on on Russia to return the children and to stop their policy. But the main purpose of the ICC is to um, take the people respons that, that are responsible to court. I see. And uh, Mr. Putin is now under the uh, gunpoint of the international law. And apart from the complicating logistics for Putin now, what other problems does international um, uh, persecution pose for him? Yeah, so you're right um, now that the arrest warrants are issued against Vladimir Putin, his formerly a, a wanted man, and it will constrain the, it's his ability, sorry, his ability to go abroad. And it is a big constraint for, for, um, for a head of state. Mm -hmm. uh, but it will also compromise maybe his future as a head of state. Because even in one, two or three years, when the war will, will, will stop, um, Vladimir Putin will still be under arrest, mm -hmm. uh, under this, uh, this pressure of the arrest warrants. And he will not be able to, to fulfill uh, his duty as a head of state uh, even after the war. So it's really um, something that will have consequences also in the future. Now it already has consequences because it, label, uh, it labels um, Vladimir Putin as a war criminal. Um, and he, he's already very uh, limiting, limited in, in his uh, ability to go abroad. Mm -hmm. But in the future, the problem will, will last. And we can imagine that it, it will not be easy for head of state to be under this arrest warrant for a long period of time. Yeah, that, that really makes some point. But let's assume that one day Putin will sit on the dock and the International Criminal Court will still demonstrate the rule of the law in the world. So what will happen then? And how other authoritarian regimes will react, like in Belarus or maybe other countries with those regimes? So you're, you're perfectly right. Um, the ICC doesn't have the ability to go and arrest a person. Mm -hmm. uh, the ICC needs uh, the cooperation of states to arrest a person. Uh, and all member states of the Rome Statutes um, have the obligation, legal obligation, to arrest a person that is under an arrest warrant, even if he is a head of state. And the authoritarian um, regimes uh, that you mentioned, like Belarus, uh, are very often not part of the Rome Statutes. So they are not under this obligation to cooperate. So it will not uh, limit uh, Vladimir Putin to go to these kind of authoritarian regimes in the future or now. However, uh, the cooperation between countries, bet between uh, a country with Russia, will be also limited by this uh, arrest warrant because the international pressure will be um, huge on, on these countries that will cooperate with Russia. We can assume that, that uh, this pressure will be in very important. Thank you. Thank you so much for being the guest of Spotlight Ukraine once again, and thank you for finding some time. So, Monsieur Gabriel Seba, the lawyer from the Paris Bar, was the guest of our program. And now we continue.
Convulsions of the so-called Second Army of the World. Russia has begun to demothball military junk from the Second World War as it has lost its latest equipment at the front. The Pentagon said that no one could have imagined that Ukraine could be able to deplete the enemy to such an extent. And they are very positive about our chances of a successful counteroffensive. When it will start and what the situation at the front line is now, see in our review. Ukrainian troops continue to hold back Russians in bombed but not conquered Bakhmut. The city is under constant shelling with cassettes and mines. There is practically no one in the street. Everyone is either on positions or in shelters. I would like to say that this part of the city is under control of the Ukrainian armed forces and the enemy cannot get here. According to the American Institute for the Study of War, the Russians probably captured 65% of Bakhmut. However, the Ukrainian military made a breakthrough on the northern outskirts and took control of the approaches to the Bakhmut Slavyansk Highway. Avdiivka is becoming the epicenter of the Russian offensive in the east, the Defense Forces headquarters said. 2,000 people, including seven children, remain in the city. They are being persuaded to leave. Would you like to leave for a safer place, a place with children and normal education? When will you leave? I don't know. When it will be critical, I will leave. But your child is willing to go. Experts critically assess the offensive capabilities of Russia, which, due to the catastrophic loss of equipment, is decommissioning even the Second World War tanks. The video shows an echelon of T-54 and T-55 tanks being transported by Russian railroad. According to the Defense Express analysts, the occupiers have up to 2,800 such vehicles in military dumps. However, due to the lack of components, even the modernization of much newer equipment in Russia is disrupted. The Russian occupation forces can conduct limited offensive actions today only on the Donetsk bridgehead and again limited ones along a narrow front or in a single location in the Luhansk region. They have resources, but the conditions created by the Ukrainian armed forces are not favorable for the Russians to launch offensive actions, so they mostly imitate them there. The Russians have the worst equipment and personnel in Zaporizhia and the left bank of the Kherson region, so they cannot conduct an offensive there at all, the expert adds. The Pentagon is also talking about the critical depletion of Russian forces. Ukrainians have inflicted significant casualties uh, on, uh, on the Russians and they have depleted their, uh, their inventory of uh, armored vehicles in a way that no one would have ever imagined. And so now we see Russia reaching for T-54s and T-55 tanks because of the level of damage that the Ukrainians have inflicted on it. According to Secretary Austin, Ukraine has a very good chance of a successful counteroffensive this spring. It will begin in April-May on several fronts at once, the defense minister announced. Oleksiy Reznikov personally tested the German modern combat vehicles that have already arrived in Ukraine. The Ukrainian armed forces are waiting for more Leopards and the U.S. has promised to speed up the delivery of Abrams tanks. So, my next guest, Major General Rupert Jones, the former Standing Joint Force Commander. And now we're going to discuss the situation on the front line with him. So, hello and welcome. Good evening and very nice to see you. Yeah, likewise. So, Ukraine is preparing for a large-scale counteroffensive right now. And what goals can official Kyiv achieve and where will the Kremlin be stopped? Well, I think in terms of, you know, where... Uh, where Kyiv will try and, and retake, I think would ultimately be speculation. Uh, because, you know, the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense will be studying all the latest analysis to see where they've got the very best chance of, of making a breakthrough. And, of course, uh, the Ukrainian government, the Ukrainian military have demonstrated over the last year they're very, very good at deception. So they'll get us all looking in one direction, we commentators, but also the Russians, and they'll, then they'll attack elsewhere. I think what's more significant is not where they'll attack, 
but what they will seek to achieve. Mm -hmm. So I think in, in terms of what they will look to do, it is fundamentally to break the, the deadlock. It is since since the liberation of, of Herson late last year that the battlefield has been quite static through through the through the winter. It's been a very, a very attritional, and I think what Kiev will seek to do is to change that, to break through, to break through the the Russian lines, which they did so effectively last year, to begin to maneuver again, to take the initiative. Uh, into into their into their own hands. So I think that that's what matters. Where they do it will be the the subject of very detailed study by the intelligence staff. Do you expect that uh, this counteroffensive, comparing to what we've seen last uh, uh, fall, would be more enormous, like in size? Well. I think potentially, because what was so clever about the offensives last year is they took considerable ground with relatively few forces. That's right. Now, the Russians the Russians may well not fall for that again. Of course, what's changed since then is we're beginning to see more and more Western equipment come onto the battlefield. And of course, only this week, We've seen the first Leopard 2s arriving. The British Challenger tanks have arrived. And although they're coming in quite small numbers so far, they get, they give those Ukrainian forces a real edge uh, at a tactical level. Is the weapon we got right now enough to start the counteroffensive or not yet? Well, I mean, again, I mean, Ultimately, that's where the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense will be doing really careful analysis. Do they want more? Definitely. Do they need more? Yes. But does that stop them trying to get a, get a breakthrough now? Not necessarily. And I think that'll be a really carefully judged uh, equation. You know, we, I think we've only heard today that Spain have confirmed that their six uh, Leopard 2s will arrive in early April. So, so the pipeline right. is, is coming. Of course, Kyiv want more, and they want more faster. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. So the commander-in-chief of the armed forces of Ukraine, Valery Zaluzhny, emphasized that Ukrainian defenders need Western F-16 fighter jets. So why the, uh, the, the whole West is delaying that? Yeah, it, it's such a difficult conversation, this, isn't it? Because you, you know much better than I, over the last year, NATO nations have tried to moderate the equipment they've provided to you in, in Ukraine, and they've done it because they, they've been trying not to uh, trigger President Putin into uh, expanding the war further. As you know, President Putin, whenever he gets a little bit rattled, he makes threats of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. I judge those to be empty threats, but countries take, take them very seriously. And the other thing, of course, NATO have been trying to do is keep the alliance unified. And different countries within the alliance see things slightly differently. So that's, that's the, big, the big issue. When it comes to F-16 specifically, because, you know, some months ago, people had said, well, we'll never provide Western tanks. And yet we, here we are providing Western tanks. Yep. So why why not F-16s? Well, I, I, I confess it frustrates me because I think we've got to a situation where we know, well, we can be reasonably confident that President Putin isn't going to expand the war further. Never say never, but, but it doesn't look as though he's going to. Mm -hmm. So why not provide the aircraft now? We know there's a long lead time, maybe six months, but say so start the clock now. Start training, start training the, the crews, just like we had to do to do with the tanks. You know, the, I mean, the other thing with the F-16, 26 countries around the world have been given export F-16s, including countries like Iraq. So I, I confess, I find it quite frustrating they haven't been given to Ukraine, but it comes down to that trying to judge what equipment to give without provoking Russia. It comes down to a, a sense that, you know, will the F-16s be able to be used uh, mm. uh, effectively? Uh, you know, this, as you know, very, very effective air, def air defense. So will the F-16s, to what degree will they be, be effective? For my money, I would like 
uh, an announcement that F-16s can going to be provided, let the six-month training clock start, and who knows where we're going to be um, by you know, the, the autumn of this year. Thank you for this uh, sincere uh, answer. Uh, but let's continue. So the Minister of Defense of Ukraine, uh, Alexei Reznikov, he believes that the Russian offensive continues in full swing. But the Russians are quickly exhausting their offensive capabilities due to the Ukrainian forces holding Bakhmut, which remains the Ukrainian fortress. So when Ukraine launches the spring counteroffensive, so is there any other point which town can become the Bakhmut Two or Bakhmut the second? Yeah. So, so I mean, firstly, can can I say, you know, as a, as an ex-British soldier, looking at how the Ukrainian forces have fought over the last year, but not least in how they fought at Bakhmut, I, I have nothing but admiration for their courage and their ingenuity and and the and their just their, their determination. But Bakhmut, as you know, has been a brutal fight. Uh, and, the, you know, the Russians have suffered very, very significant attrition around Bakhmut. You know, as you know, the head of the Wagner Group has admitted that it has very badly damaged his his force. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but I, I send my greatest sympathies to the Ukrainian military because, of course, you too have suffered heavy casualties. It's, it's been a heavy price to hold Bakhmut, but it's been so important, so important to drive down Russian uh, forces there, but also it's become iconic, hasn't it? President Putin wants to take that town of Bakhmut for, for iconic purposes, and Kyiv isn't going to let that happen. In terms of a second Bakhmut, I, I, I strongly hope that there won't be a second Bakhmut. And what I mean by that is if if the Ukrainian forces can break can achieve a breakthrough, they don't want attritional warfare. Your military are at their best when they're maneuvering, when they're being innovative, and they're tr they're taking ground fast in in lightning lightning uh, lightning ad advances. Uh, either that, or doing what you did in Kherson, where very very cleverly using deep fires to degrade the Russians' command and control and logistics. So I, I think for all of us, we hope there won't be a Bakhmut too. Yeah, we hope, we all hope. Um, my next question is quite difficult, but still. Um, Ukrainian expert and journalist Vitaly Portnikov, he was answering the question, uh, what will happen the day after Ukraine will, will has liberated all its territories in 1991 borders. And he said, so what will happen the next day? There is going to be a missile attack on Kyiv. So what could become the beginning of the real ending in this war? And do you believe that liberating the, all the territory of Ukraine is automatically means that the war is over? Well, I think that, you know, firstly, I would say, it's always so difficult to predict what what will will happen, but you know your president, President Zelensky, has remained adamant that the total liberation of Ukraine is is his uh, his his aim. Yeah. But I think we need to be you know realistic that that wars tend to end with talk, not with fighting. They end with talk. The difficulty we've got, we've got in this in this war, or you have in this war in particular, is that President Putin, he doesn't compromise. He shows no weakness. He so how you get to a situation where he can save some degree of face, and that's very difficult, I'm sure, for President Zelensky to to um, to accept. But but wars tend to end in some kind of compromise. What that will look like is for diplomats. What I would say as a soldier is what, what we militaries have to do is to create as strong a position in the, on the battlefield as possible when the guns fall silent. Because holding ground, holding as much ground as possible, being in a position of advantage when the talking starts is, is absolutely vital. And that's why it seems to me 
this this offensive, this spring offensive, when it comes from uh, the Ukrainian armed forces, is so important because you know time time doesn't last forever. You, the Ukrainian military, as you know so much better than I, is, is suffering heavily. The Ukrainian yeah. people is suffering hev heavily, and you know the the sooner you can get yourself into a position where where the war stops hopefully with all of ukraine liberated but if not in the in the strongest possible position that that has to be in, in kiev's uh, interests yeah but i'm afraid there's going to be a situation when for example we have uh, a very successful counteroffensive and after that Russia's Russian Federation is waiting for the next wave or the next step for the counteroffensive, and then K and then the situation can can be like forever for like for like three, five, four years. And the main question is here: Is the West ready to help us as long as it takes? And and, and of course, you know that's a question that ultimately no one can answer yep. because you know you feel you feel a fight in 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 ukraine it's your country it's your people dying you know we're sitting you know in 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 many ways in blissful ignorance in in the rest of uh, in the rest of europe and we're sending you arms we're giving you all of our support we're giving you all that emotional support but it's not us who's fighting and dying and and you know west democracies are selfish you know that's that's the reality yeah you know, that's how de, that's how politics work and you know there'll be a british general election in two years time there'll be a new president in the united states well or president biden will get re-elected you know that democratic process continues and i guess I, and president Zelensky knows this better than anybody he can't take that that this level of support for granted forever and yeah. i guess ultimately that's what president putin is trying to do it is play out the west he'll struggle to play out kiev but he might hope he can play out the west you know the rest of western europe but still let's hope uh for the victory as soon as it possible thank you so much for being the guest of spotlight ukraine major general rupert jones was uh, my guest and we continue. Thank you once again. And now it's high time to ruin the fakes uh, produced by Russian propaganda alongside my co-host tonight. This is Alexander Zemkovoy, who's the fact checker from Stop Fake. Hello and welcome. We're going to start and we're going to discuss the cases that you selected during the last week. So, Russia keeps using the language as a weapon of war. And this time, the Kremlin media reported that the Ukrainian military allegedly shelled a car with a woman and a child inside of this car because of the Russian language. How did fact checkers reveal the truth and of what really happened? See right now. The alleged Ukraine soldiers stopped the car and began to threaten the woman who speaks Russian. Later in the video, sounds of shootings are heard. Russian media claim the Ukrainian military insulted and humiliated a mother and a child because of the language. Special attention is paid to a Balkan Kreuz cross picture on the vehicle. The insignia of the vehicles of the armed forces of Ukraine are also noteworthy. It was with such signs that Nazis designated themselves, who destroyed the Russian people on the territory of the USSR during the Second World War. In fact, the Ukrainian military put solid crosses, called Cossack Cross, on their cars to distinguish themselves from the Russian forces. Meanwhile, a video shows Wehrmacht crosses. Apart from that, a number of OSINT activists were able to establish the exact geolocation where the video was filmed. It took place on the territory of the temporarily Russian-occupied Donetsk Oblast, between Donetsk and Makiivka. Ukraine's intelligence also found other proofs that the information is fake. 
Video editing is poor. At 1.35, a soldier fires using an assault rifle near the car, but there are no loud gunshots. The car window is open. There was a conversation through the window. There is no sound of the window closing. When the car is driving back, you can hear that the window is open again. There was a shot because on the video, you can see the explosion of shell casings. At the moment, there should be at least some sound. The video was criticized even by several Russian propagandists for the show, and the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, after finding out the video was fake, deleted it in few moments after posting. I'll tell you, when I saw the first time this video, so I just uh, n mentioned to myself that it's made even better than some of the Russian professional movies. But still, is it really hard to uncover the fake movies? Maybe you got some live hacks um, or something that helps you to uncover those, those, those fake movies. Well, we, we can say that we have uh, some professional life hacks, of course, but we also are very grateful for our community because during the last eight years we built a tremendous community who can debunk fakes like this themselves, and it helps us a lot because the allocation of this video was uh, um, understood, I think, like in, in two or three hours for, from the first time it was posted on social media. Uh, unfortunately, for them and likely for us, they really uh, they they've chosen the very bad road because this is uh, one of the main roads which you can find in the outskirts of Makiev, kind in, in in Donbas region near Donetsk, um, and uh, you know we debunk that uh, at the same day. And what what is interesting here that actually this fake was picked up by the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And this was something unusual because uh, usually they wait for the fake uh, to spread and then they publish it on their social uh, social media social media channels. And this time um, there there was a kind of desynchronization between debunking of this fake. Everyone already knew that this is a fake video, but they posted that and and uh, stressed out that this is actually what happened. And of course, they uh, tried to appeal to this uh, pro Kremlin narrative about Nazis in Ukraine, and it was already uh, it, it was very uh, laughable video already because uh, uh, when you see this video, you can clearly um, check that the moves of the woman and all of these soldiers. Uh, they do not correspond to the audio, which was probably uh, added uh, afterwards. And uh, also all these uh, crosses on the on the machinery uh, that were used. Also, like uh, this is like a mentioning of the Second World War again, which is uh, something important for Russians, but ridiculous for Europeans and for the rest of the world. But of course, it's it's vital and um, crucial to debunk these fakes because they can uh, really reach some people who do not understand the context and truly can believe that actually in Ukraine some uh, uh, some military uh, some Ukrainian armed for, uh, representatives of Ukrainian armed, armed forces could be uh, Nazis or could treat people yeah, like this yeah. you can trace it yeah. we this, this fake this was uh, this was uh, uh, a number one um, in, in our priority. But, but remembering the unprofessional role-playing of those actors, that's what I call the low-budget Russian movie. Yeah, now, we can say that, of course. Yeah, um, let's move on. And our second case and second fake, it's connected with the biological weapons, because this is another well-known topic by Russian propaganda. But the Kremlin somehow tries to justify its army losses, claiming that Ukraine has a, um, an anonymous weapon, for example, the combat mosquitoes, you remember, like the geese and, and whatsoever. But what propagandists came up with this time, let's get to know right now. Ukraine recruits women chemists and biologists to be sent to the front line. 
Russian media distribute information about the alleged increased mobilization of women in Ukraine, primarily with chemical and biological education. The Kremlin's so-called experts claim that Kiev is preparing for the use of biological or chemical weapons in this way. However, there is no ongoing mobilization of women in Ukraine. There is no mobilization of women. Now there are changes regarding the accounting system. Until 2026, even Ukrainian women who have a medical specialty, the only one for which they can be mobilized, will not have to register. Other professions are only on a voluntary basis, Mayer explained. The narrative about Ukraine's use of biological weapons on the battlefield was repeatedly spread by the Kremlin, but such fakes were never confirmed. For example, Stop Fake Project refuted that the Pentagon allegedly created a drone for the distribution of biological weapons, infected mosquitoes, about the existence of unnamed aircraft of the armed forces of Ukraine for spraying poisonous substances, and that Ukraine allegedly distributed fake money in Infected with tuberculosis. Well, it's not the first time they're using the biological weapons and the threats uh, of the storm, but still, this is maybe the first time they are uh, trying to emphasize the fact of the mobilization of Ukrainian women. Why? Well, because uh, they try to. Uh sell to their population the idea that Ukrainian army is almost demoralized and we don't have any reserves. Um, so uh, the people are forced to go and fight against Russians and they don't want to do that. That is why they uh, try to convince um, Russians uh, that Ukraine will no longer resist. And you see, even if women go and fight against Russians and they don't do that voluntarily, probably they don't have enough men to do this. But at the same time, we see the very strong rhetoric on the Russian TV channels that actually Ukrainian army is very strong. And now with the uh, support of Western countries, we have enough uh, mil of military equipment to fight for our to fight back our territories so they, this is kind of confusing probably for the westerners but inside of the uh, russia you have uh, plenty of voices and they sell different ideas to their population just to uh, mix this up and uh, so they could really couldn't really understand what where is the truth so today they speak about one um they they they, they speak about one idea Tomorrow, this might be uh, something different. That, that also depends on their uh, inner politics and the situation uh, in the war zone. It, it's it, again, this is something illogical. But uh, to produce different narratives, this is vital for propaganda. Because if you stick to some to one uh, explanation, uh, something can terrible can happen for you, and you will no longer have any answers. That is why you. All, all the time you need to speak very loud and in very different voices. Yeah, different kind of noises, informational, disinformational noises. But And, and, and following your uh, uh, points of view, recently, for example, the K Russian media spread the information that a concentration camp, I'm not even joking right now, the concentration camp uh, for those who do not want to fight with Russia was organized near Odessa. More about this in Spotlight Ukraine right now. Let's watch. The Kyiv regime organized a concentration camp in Odessa Oblast for Ukrainians who do not want to fight with Russia and refuse to be drafted into the troops. Yuri Barbashov, head of the administration of the Snihurivka district, told RIA Novosti. Barbashov, the self-proclaimed head of the Snihurivka district, did not provide any factual photo or video evidence of the existence of the so-called concentration camp near Odessa. Odessa Oblast military administration claims that he simply made up this story and recorded a video, which was immediately distributed by the Russian media. Fakes are fakes. I would just like to mention that we have a lot of training grounds where Ukrainians prepare to destroy the enemy. So the enemy, brace yourself. Russian propaganda actively spreads fakes about mobilization in Ukraine with the aim of undermining Ukrainians' trust in the state and inflaming protest sentiments.
So what is the main aim of this uh, fake? Is this about to disrupt the mobilization in Ukraine? Again, uh, they try to convince their own people that uh, Ukraine is uh, weak and won't uh, fight anymore. But at the same time, uh, you know, these fakes, uh, they are uh, mm, some kind of uh, frightening for their own population because uh, they give them the idea that all that is happening in Ukraine really is very similar to the Second World War and Ukrainians use the same methods. Um, unfortunately, we also need to debunk those fakes, even though they are kind of ridiculous. But, uh, you know, showing the idea that uh, Ukrainians don't want to fight against Russians, this also is uh, the proof for the Russian Federation that actually some Ukrainians, they really do believe that they are like, uh, um, they, uh, you, that Ukrainians and Russians uh, are as, uh, as the same nation, and that is why people just don't want to, uh, wow. to fight for Ukraine, because they, uh, they think that actually this is like a part of Russia. Um, and, you know, <laughs> regarding this, probably this uh, would be very interesting for me even to check uh, if uh, something uh, similar uh, is located in Odessa, because uh, I am from Odessa, this is my native city. <laughs> I, I've never heard anything uh, more ridiculous than this, and I'm, I'm very glad that Sergei Brachuk really debunked this fake, and uh, we can say that, of course, uh, this is uh, just to create this uh, narrative about uh, the Nazi Ukraine, who do not, uh, where the population just do not want to uh, fight against the Russian army. But, 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 but as an inhabitant of Odessa, now you, you have to admit the fact. In, instead of the concentration camp, you do have the Sun Tan camp. Am I right? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, 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 we'll check that and discuss that next time. Yeah, after the, vict <laughs> after the victory, we'll all come to Odessa to, to have and bathe under the sun, because the sun tan is what, and, and the sea is what Odessa is famous for. Thank you. See you next week, uh, Alexander Zamkovoy. Uh, the guy from Odessa, or the fact checker from uh, the Stop Fake, was the co-host of Spotlight Ukraine, and we continue. What historical responsibility awaits Russia for all the crimes committed in Ukraine? The Kremlin has made itself dependent on China. And why Western financial aid to Ukraine should not be concentrated in the hands of one person? My colleague Yuri Fieser asked Timothy Snyder, a professor of history at Yale University, about this and more. And here is a small piece of that conversation. Hello, my name is Yuri Fieser. My guest today is a world-renowned historian, professor of history at Yale University. A man who helps Ukraine a lot, he tells the truth about what is happening here, about the Russian war. He tells this so that the world knows it. Timothy Snyder. Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to talk to you and to ask you a few questions. Glad to be with you. Should Putin be afraid? Let's talk about the latest decision of the International Criminal Court in Dutch Haag. Uh, and this uh, court issued a statement, issued a decision uh, uh, to issue a arrest warrant for Mr. Putin. Should he be afraid about this? Or maybe he's sitting somewhere in Kremlin, uh, beside Kremlin walls, and is just laughing? As far as Putin, he's probably not concerned about being arrested, but I don't think he likes being condemned by the West. Why? Uh, well, because although the Russians tell us every day that they, they hate us and they don't care about us and they despise us, the West is nevertheless their only source of internal prestige. It's where they send their children to study in school. It's, it, it's the model for how they dress and for how they talk and how they do television. And they care. You know, it's, it, it, Putin will not forget that this happened to him, and neither will, neither will Russian history. I also think it makes his life more complicated, because 
you know, any thought that he could now travel to Germany or he could now travel at some point to, you know, 132 countries has now been made more complicated. But maybe even more important than that is that this is a, this will be read inside Russian domestic politics. Mm -hmm. There are many reasons. Will be. Will be, yeah. I mean, there are many reasons to think that the Putin regime should come to an end. Again, just if you're a, a, a Russian player now, and this is this is one more reason. Mm -hmm. it, does, it, doesn't, it doesn't help your country to have a leader who can't travel and is seen by many people as a war criminal. To explain what is happening right now in Russia, you even invented the special term, schizofascism. So I have two questions about this. First, um, can you please uh, tell more about it? What is the difference between schizofascism and just fascism? And uh, uh, has this Russian schizofascism somehow evolved during the year after the beginning of the full-scale invasion? But schizofascism means I'm a fascist, and I say you're the fascist. And this this term, I think, helps us to understand what Russia is. So two doing. fascists talk about fascism. Yeah. Yeah. Fa I mean, so for in Russian, I mean, as you know, but in Russian, Nazi or fascist means my enemy. It means a not Russian. It doesn't have any substantive content. So when people in the West hear the word fascism or Nazi, we think, okay, you're talking about concentration camps and a one-party state and all these things. But in, a, in the official, in, in, in Russian political language, it just means the enemy, whoever I don't like today, that's all it means. Whoever's against us, that's all it means. And so people who really are fascists, like Alexander Dugin or Prokhanov, they have no trouble calling people who are liberals or Democrats fascists, mm -hmm. because to them it just means, well, you're against Russia, you're, the, you're my enemy of choice today. And that's the important thing, because it's actually fascism which is all about enemies. You know, so that someone has to think about this a little bit. The fact that the fascists are calling you a fascist actually just means that they're fascists. You can watch your refuser's full interview with Yale history professor Timothy Schneider on Spotlight Ukraine YouTube channel. And you're watching Spotlight Ukraine, and they say they are clergymen, but they attack people. Representatives of the Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate attack journalists with their fists. This happened when a commission of the Ministry of Culture of Ukraine visited Kiev Pachevsk Lavra to take an inventory of the property, as the lease of the shrine has expired and the Ukrainian site was not going to renew the agreement with the Russian church. However, the priests did not allow either officials or journalists to enter the church, and the rector, Metropolitan Petro Levit, even tried to expel media representatives, including our correspondent from the church. Just watch it. I did not invite you. You hinder the work of journalists. Once again, get out of here. But I'd rather say, in truth, we trust. Thank you for watching. That was Spotlight Ukraine. Do not forget to like, share, and subscribe on our official YouTube channel, Espresso TV Spotlight Ukraine. Thank you, and see you next week. Do